Hi everyone. So just to begin my talk, I'd like everyone here to imagine that you're British. And now, if you're anything like me, when you wake up in the morning, you'll open up Facebook and then you'll scroll through your newsfeed and you'll look at all the articles, photos and videos that have been posted overnight. Now imagine that you stumble across this article by the Daily Express. Germany plots tax on British motorists to cover a growing bill for its 1.1 million migrants. And then you wonder, hey, what's going on? What's this foreign government doing? And so you open the article and you read further in, and then you discover that Angela Merkel has opened up Germany to, a Syrian, to Syrian asylum seekers. And these asylum seekers are placing a strain on Germany's budget. They're there in Germany committing all these crimes. They're raping women on New Year's Day. And here you have this foreign government that's taking in all these foreign refugees. They're going to put themselves on the world stage as this bastion of light and truth and hope. And then they're going to make you pay for it. They're going to make you, the British taxpayer, foot the bill for this decision. How many of you think that this tax is fair? This is a foreign government that's making you pay for their decision. No one. And so with this in mind, I'd like to introduce you to these four children. Dala, Hadia, Mohammed, and Saif. Now imagine this. You've grown up in Syria your whole life. Sure, it's war-torn, and there's plenty of violence, and there's lots of conflict, but hey, Syria's home. But one day, that conflict grows so bad that you have to leave. You have to run away from Syria. And while you're escaping from Syria, your father dies. And so now, you're a foreign refugee, living in a foreign and strange land, living in extreme poverty, raised by a single mother who works herself to the bone, working multiple odd jobs just to put some food on the table so that you won't starve to death. And here you have Karam Foundation saying that you can help these children by donating to them and helping them out by maybe giving them the money they need to have some food, to have housing, to give them an education, the education that they need to escape this poverty trap. How many of you here would click that donation button to help these children? One there, one there. See, you have more hands, you have more people willing to donate to help these children. And so this brings me to my point. Empathy. You see, a lot of us here are familiar with the difference between empathy and sympathy. You know, we're always told that sympathy is this thing where you look at someone's problems and go, ooh, yeah, you're in a bad state. You know, at least you have this, this, this going for you. And we're always told that empathy is about relating to another person, being able to understand their problems by relating to your own experiences. But hang on a minute. Just a few minutes ago, I was able to, through the use of emotive, emotionally charged language, I was able to change your empathy, who you empathized with, from the British taxpayer to these Syrian children. You see, the money that Germany is collecting will ultimately go to these Syrian children, to refugees like these Syrian children. And so why was there this change? Why was there this change in empathy? And this brings me to my first issue about empathy. You see, the thing about empathy is that because it's about relating to our own experiences, we're able to empathize a lot better with people who have experiences that are similar to our own. And I'm not saying that this is a bad thing. I think this is a great thing. In fact, this is the reason why there's so much funding for things like cancer research, research into cures for AIDS and for Alzheimer's and dementia. And all these are great and wonderful causes. But at the same time, this ability to disproportionately empathize better with groups of people whose experiences reflect our own is the reason why in 2014, the world had to dump tens of thousands of buckets of ice water on their heads before we finally found out what amyotrophic lateral sclerosis was, or ALS. And then we wonder why. And to further, exp further expand on my point, I'll tell, you, uh, I'll tell you the story of two small girls born in the mid-1940s. The first is that of Kathy Ann Fiskus. The second one is that of Christia Wise. Oh, Kathy Ann Fiskus was born in 1945 in suburban LA. And when she was three years old, she was playing in her backyard when she fell into a well that her father had dug in 1903. And so 68 years ago on this day, the whole of the United States had, had its attention turned on the rescue effort, just meant to bring this little girl out of the well. The whole world felt for Kathy Ann Fiskus. The whole world felt, thought how scared she must be down in that little well. And eventually when she was brought out, they found her dead at the bottom of the well. 
And so she was buried, and she was remembered as the little girl who united the nation for a moment. Now, I want you to bring you to the story of Christia Weiss. Now, Christia Weiss was born in 1946 to an Austrian woman, uh, and she was the daughter of, she was the illegitimate daughter of a Red Army soldier. Now, Christia Weiss is one of is one is known as is what we, is what is known as one of the is one of the occupation children. She's called as an occupation children, uh, as occupation child in uh, her home country, because she is the daughter of a foreign soldier. And so, as a child, she grew up being ostracized by her peers because her peers were told to ignore her, to leave her alone, because she was the daughter of the enemy. And then, when she grew up, her husband hurled hurtful comments at her because of her background and because of her backstory. And so Christia Wise lived, lived in this emotional and psychological, psychological well of hurt and pain for her whole life. And in fact, the interesting thing is, this picture you see here, this little girl you see on the screen, may not even be Christia Wise. You see, I came to know about Christia Wise's story through an article on the BBC, some obscure article on the BBC about these children. And Christia Wise's story was just a small anecdote in the whole article. And it just so happened that this picture was next to her anecdote. And underneath that picture, there's this caption about the children. And so here we see this ability to empathize with people like Kathy Ann Fiskus has led to the world paying a disproportionately large amount of attention and giving a lot more of our sympathy to people like her, while people like Christia Wise, who are in no less need of help and care and love, just fade away from history, just like that. And we wonder why. Why is it like this? What, what happened? And so I think that at the end of the day, all this draws its roots from the way we view the world. You see, this is how we would like to view the world. We'd like to see ourselves as this small speck in this larger social fabric of the world. And it's true. This is the objective truth. And as rational social creatures, we realize that. But ultimately, at the end of the day, in spite of what we like to think, that this is us and this is the rest of the world, the sad reality is that in our minds, this is what it looks like. It's big me, and the rest of the world is this little tiny circle that we can look through when we don't feel like it, and we can connect with it when we feel like it, and really, this is where we empathize with people, but there's so much of the world that we don't really care about because our own experiences don't overlap with it. And so ultimately, in essence, while we like to think that we're like these rabbits, the truth of the matter is, we're really more like this rabbit here. It's all about me. Deal with it. And you know, it's not this mentality of it's all about me, deal with it, that's dangerous. It's the idea that, that we're like this, but we actually think that we're like this, that's really dangerous. Because we go around thinking, that we've done some good, that we've helped another person, but in reality, what we've done is to simply project ourselves onto another person and think that we've helped them. We walk away thinking that we've, that we've done something good, we've changed the world, but in reality, we've just hurt them. For example, take animal cruelty. In so many countries, there's so many laws about how to kill mammals like sheep, pigs, cows. There's so many laws on how to kill them humanely. You have to stun them, you have to make sure they're unconscious before you slit their throats, and you have to make sure that they die a quick death. And that's because as mammals, we recognize their calls of distress when they're being led into the abattoir, when they see the knife, we recognize the pain that they see. But at the same time, you have the fishing industry, which drags up millions upon billions of fish out of the water every year, every day, and these fish die a slow and painful death, out of the water, they suffocate, but does anyone care? Does anyone say, hey, these fish are dying? No, no one. And that's because we can't empathize with them. Does it mean that their pain is any less? No. And so it's because of this that we see some problems of em related to empathy emerging. And the first problem is empathy, first of all, is tiring <clears throat> and emotionally draining. You know, just extending on this metaphor of, a ra of rabbits, you know, all of us are like rabbits, and we all have our own, we have our own struggles, we have our own dark periods, and I like to liken this to rabbit holes, these dark little holes. And so when we empathize with someone, it's akin to seeing someone stuck in a rabbit hole, and you say, hey, you know, I'm going to empathize with this person, so I'm going to dig a hole, 
I'm going to dig a hole of my own, and I'm going to sit in that hole, and I'm going to feel for myself what it's like to be in that hole. But the truth of the matter is, digging a hole and putting yourself in that hole and imagining what it's like to be stuck there is very tiring. It's taxing because you're, you're going beyond yourself. You're, you're in a way defying this, this idea of how it's all about me at the end of the day. And so we come to this next idea of how the world looks more like this. You see, because it's so tiring and emotionally draining to go about empathizing with people, digging holes and sitting in the holes, imagine what it's like. You see, for every hole that we jump into, for every hole that we, 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 perfect, we are perfectly able to, to sit in and really feel what it's like to be there in there, there are many more holes around. The world is littered with plenty of rabbit holes. And so we're, for every hole that we jump into, there are hundreds upon thousands more holes that we'll never be able to see, that we'll never be able to jump into. And this really brings me to my next point. You see, the thing about empathy, the thing about digging holes and jumping into it, this whole process of empathy is flawed. Why? Because when we are digging a hole, when we sit in it, and when we eventually find a way to jump of it and eventually tell the other rabbit in the hole, hey, I found a way out. Yeah, it's dark in there, but I found a way out. You see, that whole process is influenced by our own personal experiences, our own memories, our own pains, our own values. And, none of those, va and those values can never be exactly the same as that of the other person. And so the hole we dig can never be the same. The way we see the hole can never be the same. What might be a dark and scary hole to one person might be a small, tight, cozy space to you. And the way you jump out of the hole will also be different. And so what this ultimately means is that pure empathy, being truly able to completely put yourself in someone else's shoes, is not only emotionally draining and tiring, but it's also practically impossible. You know, just to illustrate my point, I'd just like to show you this picture of rabbits. You see, empathy is, is like, empathizing with someone is like being like this rabbit here. This rabbit here has decided, okay, I'll dig another hole so that I know what it's like to be this hole, this rabbit in this hole. But what do you notice? You see that this hole this rabbit has dug is not exactly the same as this hole. You see, this rabbit has taken this path down into this hole, but this rabbit has taken this path down into the hole. So while there is some similarity, it's not perfectly the same. And the experience of this rabbit may not be the same as the experience of this rabbit. And so what do we do? Are we stuck to becoming these selfish creatures who, who, who can't fully empathize? No. Where empathy is unable to help us help other people with this idea of compassion that comes in. You see, compassion is different, even though we often conflate compassion and empathy. They're very different things. And you see, compassion is illustrated by this rabbit here. You see, the idea of compassion is we don't necessarily have to reach all the way down into the rabbit hole like empathy demands we do. Empathy means that we have to become the rabbit, we have to sit in the hole, and we have to really understand and fully think about, oh, this whole hole is dark, it's scary. We fully have to understand that. But the thing is impossible. The thing is that it's impossible. But with compassion, you see, compassion doesn't demand that we fully enter the rabbit hole. Compassion, on the other hand, requires that you reach a hand out into the rabbit hole. And you call out to the rabbit that's hiding in the hole, and you say, you can come out when you want to. And that's very different from empathy. Because you see, empathy is a personal experience where you sit in the hole by yourself and you think about how painful it is. Compassion reaches out. Compassion places control in the, hands of the, other, control in the hand of the other person, more so than empathy does. Because in, when you have compassion, you reach out to the rabbit and to the rabbit in the hole, and it's ultimately up to the rabbit in the hole to say, yes, I want to come out, and then you can help the rabbit out. Compassion says, it's okay if you can't fully go down the rabbit hole, because it's not about you, more so than empathy says, than empathy thinks it is. And so I just want to leave you on a final note of this idea of compassion. I'd just like to implore all of you, so whenever you see a rabbit hole, I'd just like to ask that all of you don't go about digging rabbit holes because this world has plenty of rabbit holes. We all have our own you know, dark places to live in. And if other people, other people live in shallow holes, some people have really dark and scary holes to live in, some people live in holes that are so dark and scary that they don't even realize that they're in the hole. And so 
Instead of thinking that we can dig holes to exactly emulate that of other people's holes, I'd just like to implore all of you that the next time you see a rabbit hole, the next time you see someone in need, I'd just like to ask all of you to instead reach a hand out into that hole and pull the rabbit out. Because there's so much more power in that. Because you free another person. And that's the main power of compassion over empathy. Thank you.